Hey, I want to welcome you to the Holy Week Bible Study, Wednesday edition. Uh, once again, uh, today I want to open with a, a prayer from the old United Methodist Book of Worship for, for Church and Home with a prayer for Holy Wednesday. Assist us mercifully with thy help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the meditation of those mighty acts through which thou hast given unto us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glad you're here. If you want to go ahead and, and grab uh, your Bible and get something to mark four different places, uh, we're going to look at passages in all four gospel accounts tonight. Today, uh, the events that we're going to look at today uh, are all pretty pretty similar. Uh, there's We'll get into more of that in a minute, but Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 16 in Matthew 26, starting at verse 6, Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11, Mark 14, starting at verse 1, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. Verses 1 to 6, Luke 22, and John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, John 12. So if you've got your places marked in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 12. The events we're going to look at today, scholars disagree on what day this actually happened. Some say Tuesday, some suggest Wednesday. Some say it was Friday or Saturday before Palm Sunday. So, so we're just going to discuss it like it was on Wednesday and, and go ahead. I'll lift up what some of the differences are as we go and, and look at those. We're going to start with Mark chapter 14. So if you want to flip over to Mark chapter 14, I'm going to start at verse 1. Mark says, now the Pharisees, excuse me, now the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, we're only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were, were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may rise. Let's look at the second part of that verse first. The religious leaders of Israel are looking for some way to take Jesus out. They aren't looking at murder for hire. They want to see him suffer. Mark says they were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they don't want to do it during the feast because of how much the, the people respected Jesus. Uh, with the numbers of the people that, that are in Jerusalem, right, remember Jerusalem's numbers swelled back then to, to over 2 million people in that small confined space during the time of the feast. Is every Jewish male that could get to Jerusalem was required by law to be there for that particular feast. So as they were, were moving and, and going in, bringing their families with them, you had people from all over the, 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 the Roman world that could travel to that point at that time who were Jews, and they would bring their families if they could afford to, and, and that was their vacation. So the numbers were huge, and they were there was always concern. The, the Roman soldiers, uh, they, they would strengthen the numbers of the garrison there in Jerusalem. And, and just would continue to, to, to try and keep control because they feared that many people. And the Romans weren't the only ones. The Jewish religious leaders were afraid that if the people turned on them and went for Jesus, that they would lose their power. So, so they're afraid of the people. Uh, now, on the, the first, if you, if you turn over to, to Luke chapter 2, uh, excuse me, Luke 22. Verses 1 and 2. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Uh, they're terrified. Mark says, not during the feast, or the people may write. Luke says, for they were afraid of the people. And, and those numbers were, were, were terrifying to them. Now, in the first part of Mark 14, 2, Mark says that the Passover is two days away. Now, this is, this is the confusing part, and I'm going to do my best to explain it. 
we'll talk about this a lot more as, as we go on through through uh, explaining the rest of the feast, especially uh, Thursday and, and, and talking about Thursday and Friday. Now, for us, Tuesday is two, two days before Thursday, and it is, okay? Thursday, Tuesday is two days before Thursday. But our days start at sunrise. The Jewish day started at sunset. In the creation story we read in Genesis 1-5, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So for the Jews in Jesus' day, their day started at sunset. So two days before we would have started, it's two days before would have started at sunset on Tuesday evening. And gone through the day on Wednesday until sunset on Wednesday. Try, try, try and show it. Uh, up until now, we've been reading passages uh, uh, about the next morning, but now it's talking about number of days. So, so to do that, we got to talk about what the days are. Here is a rough chart, and I don't know if you're going to be able to, to even make it out. I hope you can. But our days start at sunrise. And go till the next sunrise. So we've got Tuesday, we've got we we got Wednesday, we've got Thursday, we've got Friday, we've got Saturday. For the Jews in that day, as you're looking at it, unleavened bread started at sunset on Friday and went to sunset on Saturday. Passover started on what is would have been sunset on our Thursday. And went to sunset on Friday. That's why Jesus is. We'll talk on, on on Passover. Jesus on Passover had the Last Supper, went to the Garden, was arrested, went back, had the trial, appeared before Herod, back and forth Herod Pilate, um, crucifixion, buried at sunset on unleavened bread. So so as we'll talk about Thursday and and Friday. Jesus is literally on Passover. He sacrificed on unleavened bread. He's buried, and on first fruits, which we'll get to later, uh, he's raised. So, so, so that's how that breaks down. So, two days before Passover, you've got at sunset. So the next, the the one day is the day of preparation. The next day starts at sunset on Tuesday. So so what would it be two days before would have started at sunset on Tuesday and extended into Wednesday. So with all of that, it, it's great. It's confusing. And and so <laughs> as you would go through this, I'm going to try and explain it better. I hope it's confu clear, somewhat clear. So now then that it's clear that it was two days before, I, I'm, I, I really want to confuse it. Flip over to John. Chapter 12, John chapter 12. Let's look at verses 1 to, starting at verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Six days. So six days before the Passover. If you follow the chart and go back, go take that back, six days would have started the bright at sunset the Friday before what we know is Palm Sunday. In fact, if you look down to, to John chapter 12, verse, thir verse 12, it says the next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. The next day, if if The next day, starting at sunset, when, when it was it started at Friday at sunset, the next day would have started Saturday at sunset. So it would have gone through the day of Sunday. And, and so that's why he, he says that. So John has this anointing that we're going to talk about to, to, today before Palm Sunday, while the other Gospels place it afterward. One possibility in all of that is the probability that Jesus and the disciples uh, stayed at the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha for the duration of the feast. 
Jerusalem was crowded with so many, and they, they had dear friends down the road in Bethany that gladly opened their home to them, and apparently had throughout Jesus' ministry. It's possible that, that Jesus and the disciples arrived, arrived there six days before Passover, and at some other point, possibly maybe even after the triumphal entry, there was the dinner to honor Jesus that was given. The bottom eight line is we don't know the exact time. We just know this happened sometime in the week before Jesus' death. John, if we stay there, goes on in John chapter 12, verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Here's another place where you get confused in a couple of different points. We picture them sitting around a table like our dining room table or our kitchen table. That's not how it was. That we don't, They weren't sitting in chairs. It wasn't that. What does John say after the comma in verse 2? While Lazarus, in, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. The tables in that day were Roman tables. They were more along the height of, of what we would consider coffee table, but probably even a little lower. They were often shaped like a semicircle. So the diners would prop on pillows on one arm, they would prop on one side and would be eating with the other hand. And as they gathered around that table, in the account of the Last Supper, it's not like the picture that, that we have of, 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 of the Last Supper, where, where the disciples are all sitting along one, one long table. They're reclined. And when the comments there about John had his head upon Jesus' breast, or the disciple whom he loved had, John's propped next to Jesus. And so G John, whether they're propped left or right, I you know, that you would have to go back and look. But as he's propped, when he asks Jesus to question, he leans back and turns to ask Jesus. And as he does that, his head is literally on Jesus' chest as they're sitting, laying, reclining, propped on this pillow around this table. So that, that's one part of the confusion, I, I think, with that and, and why, uh, why some people have difficulty with, with, with the next, next parts. Uh, there's another thing that, that some would point out as contradiction. If you flip back to Mark 14, 3, Mark 14, 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Whose house was Jesus at in, in Mark's account? Simon the leper's. Where did she pour the perfume? On Jesus' head. Okay, flip over to Matthew 26, starting in verse 6. Matthew 26, 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man named, known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. Whose house? Simon the leper's. Where did she pour the perfume? On Jesus' head. Okay, let's talk about the house. John says in John chapter 12, flip back over, John 12, Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus is raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Jesus went to Bethany along with the disciples six days before, before the Passover. But John says here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Now, I'm guessing Simon the leper isn't a leper if Jesus is eating at his house. Could it be that everybody in Bethany knew that Jesus stayed at Lazarus's throughout the time of the feast? So Simon asked if, if everyone could come and let him honor Jesus with a meal because he had probably healed Simon as well and many other people in Bethany. So as the people come to celebrate Jesus and how he's changed their life, he has Jesus come into his house and Lazarus is reclining at the table as well. Now, Martha, what we know from the account of, of Jesus and his interaction with Mary and Martha, uh, Martha's one of those worker bee ladies. 
Uh, she's always going to be one that's cooking and serving no matter where she's at. If there's any way she can get to the kitchen, she's going to be one of those that's in the kitchen cooking. Simon's doing this, and she's helping. It has not been that long since Jesus raised Lazarus, and she wants to, to, to do her part in this honoring of Jesus. So what does John say happen? Let's, let's stick with John for a minute. Verse 3, Then Mary took about a paint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, Perfume. Perfume. <laughs> I'm still trying to get used to this. I have problems talking anyway, but talking to a, a computer monitor and, and, and is, is a different thing for me. Uh, Mary took about a paint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Okay. Head, feet. Head, feet. What? Two Gospels say head, one says feet. Uh, there's another account of anointing of Jesus in Luke chapter 7, but it's not around the Passion. These other three are all in that time frame. Uh, some have suggested that the placement of the event by Matthew and Mark is to show the contrast that the hatred of the Jews ready to kill Jesus and looking for ways to kill Jesus and the love and the devotion of Mary. Now, people in that day were usually anointed over their head, but John has a beautiful description of Mary taking the role of a servant, wiping Jesus' feet. Interestingly enough, John's the only one to give us the account of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and that's in the next chapter of his gospel. Now, the Luke story, that passage in Luke 7, that it's not around the Passion, and the account in John are both very similar. Both had the woman pouring perfume on his feet. The Luke account is about a woman who was a prostitute. And a lot of people think Mary was a prostitute. She wasn't. They're getting they're confused in those accounts. The Luke account is at the home of a Pharisee. The John accounts at the home of Simon the leper in Bethany, seemingly. And Lazarus is a guest there as well. So what happens? John says, verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why was it this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now, as you look at that, John has no love lost for Judas. Interestingly, Matthew nor Mark single him out as the one who was complaining. If you flip over to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26, look at verse 8. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. All right, let's flip over to Mark's account, Mark 14. And let's see, see how he handles this. Mark 14, 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Matthew and Mark have a number of folks complaining. John just mentions Judas. But the rest of the story is so similar between the th all three. Jesus defending her, acknowledging the beautiful thing that she's done, and since they were complaining what she had offered, Jesus should have been given to the poor. Jesus made the prophetic statement, the poor you will always have with you. 
Mark adds, and you can help them anytime you want. And they all agree, but you will not always have me. And Jesus is talking about preparing his body for burial. And Matthew and Mark say that what she had, been, had done would be told throughout the world as part of the gospel. Now flip back to Luke chapter 22 and look at verse 3. Luke 22, pick it up at verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Luke says Satan entered Judas and explains Judas's actions in that light. It's interesting as you read the account and, and look at that, he consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Why? They were afraid of the people. They needed to be in control of the situation and the people be pawns and not leaders. And so that they, they needed to get what they perceived as the leader of the people, Jesus, out of the way while they could. Matthew says, if you flip over to Matthew 26, look down to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Flip back to Mark. Mark chapter 14, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now then flip back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. And came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. You've got all these pilgrims who've heard about Jesus and have never seen Jesus, who've heard these things that he's done, and the raising of this man who was dead for a number of days. These people want to see that. They want to have a part in that. So these Jews, these pilgrims, probably some from Jerusalem, probably more pilgrims from outside of Jerusalem who haven't had as much maybe interaction with Jesus and, and haven't, haven't seen that person uh, that he's touched in that way. They go. They're curious. They want to see this one. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to see Jesus, or were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Jesus scared people before he was crucified and risen. There are people who are terrified of him now. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. Satan has always done everything he could to stand in the way of Jesus having that relationship with his people. Why? Because he knows that through that relationship, people will come into an eternal relationship with God. Satan's not going to have that. He knows it. He knows his, his, his days are numbered. And with that, he's terrified. So he's always striking, always attacking. We always need to be prepared. We don't understand why bad things happen. One of the accounts is Satan entered into to Judas. Satan still operates through all kinds of different ways. And he comes after us. How? You look at Job. He went after Job's children. He went after Job's livelihood. He went after Job's health. 
lot of people saying, why is God doing this with, with this virus and everything else? Jesus went around Galilee, healing every disease and sickness. Scripture says, by his stripes, those stripes he endured on the Passover, we are healed. I don't know what your hurts or what your needs are today. There's one person that can bring you healing, bring you hope, and give you peace. He promised you not only forgiveness, but eternal life with him. If you haven't entered into that relationship with him, I invite you to do that. As we close out this study, again, the, the Book of Common Prayer, the prayer for the Wednesday and Holy Week. Let's pray this and then pray for our medical folks and all of those that are, are battling this fire. O oh Lord God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his back to the smiters and hid not his face from shame, grant us grace to take joyfully the suffering of the present time in full assurance of the glory that shall be revealed through the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together today. And, and Lord, we just, we do. We, we lift up all those that have answered your call to the healing ministry who, who come along beside you and work to bring healing, to bring help, to bring wholeness to your children. Father, from, from the, the custodians who are, are working and the housekeeping folks at the hospital, uh, those folks that are keeping those linens washed and everything, uh, all the way through to the people who are providing food, to the people who are, 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 are in the administration, to the people that, that are, are in the maintenance and keeping everything working. Uh, Lord, to, to all those people that come along beside you to touch those that we love. Lord, we just pray that you keep a edge of protection about them and their family. Well, we know that, that, that there, are, there are folks that, that, that are working there that, that are, are just concerned for family members, for, 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 for friends that are in that hospital. And we just pray that you would just continue to give them your peace and let them hang on to you each day to see your hand at work. We pray for those that are sick, that you would bring healing. Lord, we just pray that you would stop this virus right now. Uh, that, that we would just see the, the most incredible thing on Easter Sunday is, is it stops around the world. And, and, and Lord, that you would receive all the credit and glory for that. Father, pray we pray for those patients, that you just let them feel your peace and your presence when their family can't be with them especially. Lord, we pray for, for Craig Knowles, the chaplain at the hospital, and, and Lord, he's, his plate is so full of, as he ministers to everybody, be with be with him. And Lord, just be with those folks and let them feel that, that peace. Be with their family. And Lord, just continue to be with all of us. As we go through our daily business, as we as we as folks are trying to, to be the teacher at home now, trying to help their kids with classwork. Lord, help us through these days. As I said in the front is that's coming out, they like Tony Campolo and the, the sermon that he, he referenced. Uh, Friday was tough, and, and it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. We thank you that Sunday came, and Sunday's coming again. Take us from this time, in Jesus' name.